Bibles once again this morning over to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2. Now y'all knew that, right? Y'all knew we were in chapter 2 here. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 2, we started looking at this chapter about, I think, three or four weeks ago now. We're going to go back uh, at verse 1. It says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time to look into your precious and holy word. We're grateful that we can gather together here and sing the songs that express thankfulness to you for what you've done for us through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we can give glory and honor and praise to your name, not just in singing about you, but in the details of our life when we walk by faith to truly manifest the reality of Christ alive in us here and now. Well, thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so as we get going here, you'll notice I, I have a question up on the board there. Let me just erase this. Um, can you all see that there? And for the folks listening on, or watching on the internet, whether it's a YouTube or however you're watching it, we do acknowledge that the, the markers that we are using, unfortunately, we, Steve and I, we tried how many this morning, six or eight, <laughs> whatever, different ones. And we're, we're trying to work on markers that um, are much more clear online because we acknowledge that... Uh, it's really hard to read the board. Someone posted last week on the study that uh, uh, please have John get different markers and uh, different ones, especially Steve here has really been pursuing that and everything, and so we're still trying to work that out. But uh, all right, well, having said that, what's the question on the board there? Can y'all, can y'all read that here? Can y'all see that? Yeah, to whom shall he teach knowledge? Does anybody know the answer? Interesting, one that's that desire it. What's that? Babes. Okay, the babes. That's who. All right. Now, now, you know, Sean, what you said is correct, those that desire it and so forth. But that's a specific question right out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. And that's the title is, to this particular message, to whom shall he teach knowledge? It's not a general question. It's a very specific question. And as we study more in 1 Peter 2 here, you'll see why, why we're focusing on that right there. So what we do need to do is we need to go back and make sure we get a little bit of review in our thinking so that we can appreciate what, what's going on here in 1 Peter chapter number 2. So let's do that then. Let's do that. In 1 Peter 2, 1, wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, it's important to remember when he tells them to lay those things aside what was it that was producing the things he identifies in verse 1? Who remembers? It was the tradition of the elders. It was, it was specifically the tradition of the elders. The Lord Jesus Christ said about the Pharisees, says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees, it's hypocrisy. We already noted in chapter number 1 in 1 Peter 1, he reminds them what they've been redeemed from. Look back at chapter 1, verse 18. This is all review here, okay, but, but we got to get this. Look back at 1.18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from what? What does it say there? Yeah, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. See, that's a reference to the doctrine of the elders, the tradition of the doctrine of the elders that made void the word of God. 
when he, the word conversation, it's not simply that what they're saying, but their whole lifestyle, how they're conducting their life. So when they became members, when, when they believed the gospel of the kingdom, so think Acts chapter 2, at the gospel of the kingdom as preached by Peter, they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, repent, so change your mind about who you thought Christ was, and be baptized, that's part of the gospel of the kingdom, and that they would receive the Holy Ghost. So they became part of the believing remnant, the little flock. You think Acts chapter 2 is exactly what happened. So by them believing what the gospel of the kingdom was from Peter, that's how they got, when they got into the little flock, that's how they got redeemed from the tradition of the elders. Is that making sense so far how I'm saying that? That's how they got redeemed from that. It's interesting that, look back at verse 18 of chapter number one. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from an eternal destiny in the lake of fire. See, the redemption he's speaking about in verse 18 is from doctrine, not from hell. Isn't that interesting? Now, by being redeemed from the doctrine of the elders to get into the doctrine of Christ, they're going to get saved eternally in the kingdom, right? Right? But the emphasis there in chapter 1, verse 18 is they were redeemed from all that false doctrine of the elders. When, if you were to take the time and look at Matthew 23, we took a few moments. In fact, just do that real quick. Go back to Matthew 23. Turn over to Matthew 23. Look at this. Matthew 23. Look at Matthew 23, verse 1. Matthew 23 and verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Okay, so what does that mean? To sit in Moses' seat, they therefore had the authority of Moses. He says, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. So when they speak... What Moses said, then do what they tell you, because what, tell them, what they're telling you is what Moses said. So you see how he's holding up what Moses said? He's holding up the Scripture. So when they speak with the authority of Scripture, then do what they say. But notice what he continues to say. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. See, they're complete hypocrites. If you would, jump ahead. Verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and then what's the next word there? And verse 14, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, what's the next word? 15, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, and so on. All the way down through here. That's what they got redeemed from. They got redeemed from the tradition of the elders, from that doctrine when they believed the gospel of the kingdom, by believing that and become members of the little and became members of the little flock, that's how they were redeemed from, set apart, pulled away from the false doctrine taught by the elders. Now, if you go back to First Peter chapter two, go back to First Peter chapter number two. So when he says, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speaking. So, so lay aside all that false doctrine of the elders because that's what it'll produce. So, if, so don't let that be the fruit in your life anymore. Instead, look at verse 2 now. As newborn babes desire that notice the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. They were not able to grow spiritually by the doctrine of the elders. Now they have the word of God, and by trusting the word of God, that's how they will grow. Remember how he ended chapter 1? Look at verse 23. Chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You see the contrast between... 
the tradition of the elders and the word of God. They've been redeemed from the tradition of the elders. Now they're given over to the word of God, which began their life as it were. So when he tells them in verse two, as newborn babes, uh, chap chapter two, verse two, chapter two, verse two, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. What did we comment or what was the significance of the use when he says newborn babes in verse two? What, what, what did we observe or what were we made aware about that? Any idea? Very, very, they just, these are new members of the little flock. This is still real, real close to Pentecost. To, if, you, if I would do it this way, the chart's closed. Nothing about the dispensation and the grace. The, 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 um, the Holy Spirit's poured out there at Pentecost. So, so these people here, they just became members of that little flock. They're newborn babes. Okay? So it's real interesting to think about this. Not only that, we contrasted that with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians 3 when he says about the Corinthians that they were still acting like babes and worse than that, they were carnal. So in the case of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when Paul uses the word and talks to the Corinthians about being babes, that wasn't a good thing. But in the case of 1 Peter 2 here, when he uses the word babes, it's clearly a good thing. Why the difference? Anybody know, what's the difference? Yeah, the Corinthians were not growing at all. They, Paul had given them plenty of sound doctrine to grow, but they kept appealing back to human viewpoint about Scripture. So they weren't growing. Whereas in the case of 1 Peter here, he acknowledges that they're newborn babes, so if they want to grow, they need to desire the sincere milk of the word. They need to go to the right source that will have them grow spiritually. We commented about that uh, our, our two newest little granddaughters. By the way, Laurie and Garrett Kaler just had another granddaughter. Uh, I, think, I think Wednesday morning. Uh, they're, they're, I think it was, was that Wednesday morning? A little, um, little granddaughter, but they're not going to be here this morning because they've come down with a, a little bug and everything. So... And, and her mom is back in the hospital and not doing well at all. So keep, we'll, we'll mention more about that next service. But in, at any rate, the point being, that w what do you feed a newborn baby? Newborn. Mother's milk. And it's rich, the, 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 the breast milk from the mom. The first milk that comes out is the colostrum, is it colostrum? I think they call it colostrum. And it's rich, rich in all the things they need to... For the, to, to have that baby develop a whole system of immunity and, and then grow thereby. You see that? So when he says here to the, the, the remnant here, the little flock, new members of the little flock, how he says it there, as newborn babes desire. I mean, think of that little baby crying and crying and crying until they latch on and drink, right? And then it calms them down. Well, here he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere... The sincere milk, the pure milk of the word, that's in contrast to the tradition of the elders. Does everybody see what's happening here? Okay. All right, so he says at verse uh, uh, 2 again, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Now, as we, as we ran out of time last week, what we did is, you, if you would, go with me over to... Matthew 11, go to Matthew 11. We're going to look at some things and connect them here with Matthew and then with Isaiah. Look over to Matthew and uh, chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. All right, so when you're in Matthew 11, the first part of chapter 11, Matthew records to, for us when John the Baptist was still in prison and he sends two of his disciples to Christ to say, to ask, art thou he that should come or look we for another? Do you remember that? So that'll give us a, a, a kind of a, a timeline where we are in the ministry of Christ. You're still somewhat early 
John the Baptist has not been executed yet. And so Christ conveys to these two individuals what to tell John. Then as he sends John back, if you'll look at, I'm sorry, as he sends the two disciples of John back to give John the answer, look over to Isaiah, I'm sorry, look at Matthew 11, verse 7. So 11, 7. And as they departed, the they there, those are the guys that John sent to Christ that are now going back to tell John what Christ said to them. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went you out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Of course, the answer is no. That's a very common thing, and John was anything but common. What went you out in the wilderness to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Where was John? Was John in the king's house? No, he was in, in, in a prison, a king's prison, not, a, not his house. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? So here's the right answer. Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger, which, uh, uh, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. He clearly says that John is the messenger of, of, of Malachi, the prophet in Malachi that, uh, that God said would come. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. If you look over to Luke 7, hold that verse there, look over to Luke chapter 7, and I trust that you'll have this written in your notes or your Bible, make sure that you can find this cross-reference. Look over to Luke 7, 26, we're going to come back to Matthew in a moment here. Look at Luke 7, 26. He says, but what went you out for to see, a prophet? So, so there's that you're connecting back with where we were in Matthew 11. Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. Watch very carefully how he says, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. That's Malachi 3.1, verse 28. For I say unto you, Among those that are born of women... There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Let's for a moment make sure that we're grasping what he's saying. The way that Matthew has it recorded is that among those that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Luke qualifies that by saying that Christ said there's not a greater prophet than John. So the question is, well, why? I mean, wasn't Isaiah a pretty great prophet? How about Daniel? Was Daniel a pretty great prophet? Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all the prophets. So why was, of all the prophets that God ever raised up, why was John the greatest of all the prophets? What's that? Okay, and first, then David, then Tom. And what did you say? There you go. And then, David, what did you say? And so John does what? He breaks the silence. And then, Tom, what did you say? The message. The message. See that? What, what made John the greatest of all the prophets was the privilege he had of announcing the at-hand phase of the kingdom and therefore the arrival of the Messiah. He was the one that God sent to break the silence, to announce, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's all the prophets before, like, think of that, the book of Daniel, the time schedule. Daniel never said the kingdom was at hand. I, I, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they never said the kingdom was at hand. They said, in a sense, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and here's what to look for. John the Baptist shows up and says, it's at hand. Go ahead, Tony. You're going to say something? That's a great question, and the fundamental reason is, it, we'll, we'll get back to Matthew 11 here, and we'll demonstrate that in just a second, but what he, make sure you grasp the fact that when he says to the audience, you guys, if when you went out to see John in the wilderness, 
If, if you thought he was just a reed shaken with the wind, he said, you missed it. That's just a common thing. If you think that, that uh, you just went to see a, a, a circus show with a guy in soft raiment and clothing, well, those that are living easily are in king's houses. Who was the king at the time? Caesar, Pilate, Herod, and so forth. Is that, is that who you're going to equate John to? He said, but you've got to realize that when you went out to the wilderness, if you, if you went to see a prophet, yeah, and the greatest of all the prophets. The reason that he waits until he sends the disciples back, John's disciples back to John, is because the audience, the multitude, heard the, the two disciples, or, or the disciples that John sent. They heard the question, art thou he that should come, or look we for another? They heard Christ's answer. Christ doesn't say, yes, I am, or no, I'm not. Christ said, you go tell John what you see, what's being said. You go tell John to, to take and compare what I'm doing, what Christ was doing, with what the Scripture said Messiah is going to do when he's here. And if what I am doing matches what the prophet said the Messiah would do when he's, when he's here, then you have your answer. You see how he points them to Scripture so when he sends the two disciples back, he basically says, you go tell John to get his Bible out and, and compare verse with verse to see if what I'm doing matches what the prophet said Messiah would do when he showed up. And if I'm doing exactly what the prophet said Messiah would do when Messiah showed up, then John, you have your answer. So he, he wants to make sure that John is basing his confidence on the scripture. Now he says to the audience fundamentally the same thing. When he says, okay, who was John anyway? He says that to the audience. Was he just a reed shaken out of the wind? Was he a man with soft clothing? No, he was the greatest of all the prophets. And he quotes Malachi 3, and he holds the multitude accountable to the Scripture, and that God was going to break the silence, send a forerunner. That's who John was. Let's, let's, are you there in Luke 7? So you see why he waits to send why he, he turns to the audience now, he's holding them accountable for their lack of proper response to John. That's what he's doing. He's holding the audience accountable to their complete, mis their complete failure to see who John actually was. The reason they're not seeing who Christ was is because they didn't see who John was. So, are you still there in Luke 7? Watch this. Okay, look at verse 29. Watch this now. Verse 29. And all the people that heard him, to him is going to be John, John the Baptist. So, we're at Luke 7, 29. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God. How? What does that mean? being baptized with the baptism of John. What does it mean to justify God? I didn't know God was a sinner. There you go. Yeah, God, God's not a sinner. They, they justified God. They said God was right. How? By submitting to John's baptism. Well, why did, by submitting to John's baptism, why did that say God is right? How come, it, how come that justified God? Well, let's read the next verse. This will help piece this together. It says, verse 30, at verse 30, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. John's ministry, when, when God the Father sent John to preach to the nation, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Repent. They need to change their mind about what they thought about the Messiah, about the Word of God, who they were trusting, the doctrine they were believing. So when John shows up and says, repent, that means they needed to. Repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. The time schedule is there. The forerunner's there. Messiah's there and so forth. When the scribes and Pharisees, they reject what John is saying... That's how they were rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. But that also tells us, therefore, that John's ministry, what he said, is the counsel of God to the nation. 
And those that would believe what he said, recognize who he was, they would say, oh, wow, he is the spokesman. He is the forerunner. He is the forerunner of Malachi chapter 3. We better listen to what he said. And then those few would then were the ones that got into his baptism and so forth. But the rest of the nation, led by the leaders, they reject the counsel of God. They are saying, no, he's not the forerunner. He's not the voice in the wilderness. He's just nobody. He's just the reed shaken in the wind. Do you see how the little pieces together? Isn't that incredible how that all works together? Okay, so now if you would, go back to um, Matthew 11. Go back to Matthew 11 here. Look back, Matthew. Someone said something? Go ahead, Henry. Yeah. Yes. How is that? Okay, what uh, Henry's question is that, that phrase that he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Where was John? John was in bonds, in prison. His nation pretty much had forgotten who he was. They discounted who he was. And of course, what's going to happen is he's going to be beheaded by Herod. So Christ is saying that compared to that, he that is least in the kingdom, is, you're greater than John in prison. You're greater than what... John's own nation is saying about John. See that? So the believing remnant, those that were in the little flock, are greater than John in bonds, is kind of the idea. Okay, go ahead, Rich. Was John sort of doubting to a little bit? So maybe there's no doubt if you, I mean, I, I'm the least. That's least. correct. Yeah, what was happening in relationship to John is that when he gets cast into prison and it's truly Israel just forgot about him. They just, no one came and really helped him. He had a couple of disciples left, you know, a handful of disciples and everything, but as a whole, the nation just went back to their lives and everything. And so John in his question, art thou he that should come or look we for another? What happened, John in prison is allowing the pressure of being in prison and the rejection by a nation, his nation to kind of skew his thinking a little bit in terms of who John, who Christ actually was. Well, that's what's going on there. Okay. Say that again. John never, never yeah, very possibly as well that, that why didn't Christ come? It, it was not Christ's responsibility to go and get John out of prison. It would have been the nation's responsibility as it were. So Christ, in all different aspects, he's holding the nation of Israel accountable for the lack of proper response to John. And because of their lack of proper response to John, that's why they're, they're, they don't have the proper response to Christ, who he was. Okay? Did that, did that clarify that? Okay, if you would, then go back to Matthew 11 here. So then, uh, look, look at John chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew 11 here, at, at verse 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Very interesting statement. He isn't saying that the law and the prophets ceased with John. The law and the prophets prophesied the kingdom was going to come. The king was going to come. The, the forerunner is going to come. The kingdom of heaven is going to be at hand. With John, the, 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 it, everything changed in that it was now at hand. You see the significance there? They prophesied until John. That didn't mean they ceased to exist or they all failed. With John, it's now at hand. It entered in a brand new phase, a prophesied phrase, by the way. Go ahead. That's in Luke 16, 16. It says, all the flock until John entered the kingdom of God, preaching and pressing in. Yes, same parallel passage in Luke there. Okay, so now keep reading. He says at verse 16, but what went, he says, but whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. See the lack of re proper response. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. See, see their response? See what they thought about his ministry? Did he have a devil, or was he sent by God? It, the son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a winebibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. See, they rejected John and Christ. Had they received John, they would have received Christ because they would have recognized who he was. He says, But wisdom is justified of her children. One of my favorite statements that Christ ever says, Their wisdom is declared right by the children that she produces. 
Wisdom is justified by her children. Wisdom is going to bring forth some children, that which is going to lead us to this. To whom shall he teach knowledge? Keep reading. It says, verse 20, then, see the then there? You've got a major shift in his ministry right here at this point. This is, a, this is a significant shift in his ministry right here. The then right there. Then began he to upbraid the cities where most of his mighty works were done because they repented not, and so on. Now look at verse 25. At that time. You see, the, you see the then in verse 20 with the, at that time in verse 25? Does everybody see those two phrases, the, the words and the phrases? This is a major crisis point in the earthly ministry of Christ. He says this, At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto who? There's our connection right there. What he does. Christ, his ministry has been public to the nation. Led by John the Baptist. And as a whole, the nation, the leaders, and most of the people, they just went about, they didn't really see who John was or who Christ was. So Christ is acknowledging at this point in his ministry, he's gonna ch he's there's going to be a major change in his teaching style because he now is going to start looking for babes. Not the chicks, okay? <laughs> but babies, spiritually. He's going to, by his doctrine... By his continuing to preach the doctrine, the doctrine is going to manifest those in Israel who are hungry for the doctrine. When he says, at that time Jesus answered and said, I, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight." All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. The Son is going to reveal the Father to anyone that is hungry to know the Father. They are going to be the babes that he's looking for. So by him putting the doctrine out there, he's going to, by the doctrine, is going to identify those who are hungry for the truth. And the way it identifies them is they come to him. So look at the next verse. Verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see how he invites anyone that's willing to listen to his word to come to him. He's looking for those that will come to him and they are going to be the babes. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now here's what we're going to do then is go to Isaiah 28. That is a very popular verse. It, it is. It's very popular in Christianity and very few really understand the context and the timing and the significance of, of him saying this here at this point in his ministry. Okay, uh, Isaiah 28 now. Isaiah 28. Now, look at Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Watch verse 9. Does that look familiar? Isaiah 28, verse 9. What's it say there, the first question? That's kind of similar. Now, I added the word, but I'm not adding to your Bible, by the way. Okay. Look at that. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Okay, wait, wait. So before you read the next couple of verses, 
in the light of what we just studied, that sequence in Matthew 11, what's the answer to the question? The babes. That's who he's looking for. He, he's looking for those in Israel who will acknowledge who John was and therefore see who Christ was, who will pull away from the doctrine the tradition of the elders, the scribes and Pharisees, and will, as he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's who he's looking for. That's the babes. Now, what we need to do is we need to read some, the context of Isaiah 28. It's quite amazing here. So we'll just see how much we can get here, okay? Look at how it starts. Look at Isaiah 28. We're going to go to verse 1. Isaiah 28, 1. Watch, watch our context. Watch what's going on here. Woe to the crown of pride. Does that sound like a good thing, a good way to start, or not so good? That, that's a problem. If the crown you're wearing is pride, what's, what's the issue? <laughs> yeah. Um, you heard that, you heard that the guy goes to the doctor and he's just been complaining just for months and months and months about his head hurting, just all oh, his headache and everything, and his neck and his head, his shoulders, just, uh, just really bad. And so he goes to the doctor and sits down with the doctor and the doctor says, well, I'm going to have to ask you some kind of pointed questions here. And do you, do you drink much alcohol? Says, oh, I never touch the stuff. Alcohol, pff, what do you think I am? I never drink that stuff at all. I go, okay, no. Well, how about, um, do, you, do you take drugs? What do you think I am, doctor? Of course I don't take drugs. Why would I do stuff like that? Well, do you, uh, do you engage in maybe illicit activity? Doctor, I came to, wh wh who do you think I am? What's wrong? I, I don't do any of that stuff. So the doctor is kind of writing some notes and everything. He said, you know, I, I think I figured out what your problem was, what, what's creating all the headaches and the neck pain and everything. He said, your halo is way too tight. <laughs> did did, did y'all get that one? <laughs> I, I, mean, I don't know why. Man, just, let, let me loosen that halo a little bit. It's way too tight on your self-righteous head kind of a thing. <laughs> so, yeah, well... So when, when the passage starts out this way, woe to the crown of pride. If the crown you're wearing is a crown of pride, maybe you ought to take that crown off and look for another crown to wear. You can see that this is a serious indictment against the leadership of the nation of Israel, those that are in, in position to rule the nation. The problem is the crown they're wearing is not a crown of righteousness and mercy and compassion, but a crown of pride. He says this, woe to the crown of pride. Watch how graphic it gets here. To the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay, so now you combine the crown they're wearing as a crown of pride and they're total drunkards. How do you think that nation's working? <laughs> he says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. What a description of the spiritual condition of the leadership of the nation of Israel. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. So, so the mighty one, that's the Lord that's going to come and take care of them. Verse 3, the crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, shall be trodden underfoot, and the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower, and as the hasty fruit before the summer, which one he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he eateth it up. It's just, it's just the, all their glorious beauty, it's the result of self-righteous pride, arrogancy, and drunkenness, and it's all going to be cleansed and taken care of by the mighty one in verse 2 and 3. The Messiah is going to come and take care of all this. Verse 5, In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory. You see the contrast? Verse 1, you have the crown of pride worn by the leaders of the nation of Israel, but in verse 5, in that day shall the Lord, there's the Messiah who's going to come and cleanse the nation, take care of the crown of pride. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of what? 
a crown of glory, and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. The residue, that's the remnant. That's the remnant. He's going to be that crown of glory and a diadem of beauty unto the residue, to the remnant that's looking for him. So you see how there's a definite distinguishing. There's two groups here. Those that are the crown of pride and following them, those that are living under the burden of the crown of pride and are waiting for Messiah to come and rescue them, and for the Messiah to be that royal diadem, that crown of glory for the remnant. Everybody see the two groups there? Any questions about that? See what's going on there? Now let's keep reading. Verse 6, And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. You see how he's going to be? To those that wear that crown of pride, he's going to judge them. To the remnant looking for him, he's going to be their salvation. Now watch verse 7. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Watch how, descript, watch how this gets so descriptive here. The priest and the prophets, the prophet, have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. That's pretty graphic, don't you think? That's pretty descriptive. Just to even think about that, it kind of, that smell almost comes off the page of your Bible there. You know, go ahead, Tony, real quick. Is that the, uh, in, uh, conjunction with when you felt the Pharisees and error because they did not understand their doctrine? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. The, 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 the quote unquote, the wine, you see verse 7, the wine and the strong drink in verse 7. There's no doubt that they were actually drinking the actual fermented you know, wine and strong drink. drink. But, but that's secondary. The wine and the strong drink in verse 7 is the false doctrine that they're drinking. So they're drinking all, they're totally drunken into the false doctrine, and that's what they're spewing out to the nation. Look at, look at verse 1. It says, woe to the crown of pride. There's the, 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 the kings. Look at verse 7. You see the priests and the prophets? So you've got the prophets, the priests, and the, the, the royal lineage. All in the nation, they're all corrupted. They're all drinking the false doctrine of the elders. They're all drunken with that doctrine. So what is spewing out of their gut and therefore out of their mouth and therefore all over the tables and everything in God's eyes is just vomit. Just awful disgusting even to think about that. And yet that's the doctrine they were feeding to the nation. When the nation was, was, was drinking in that doctrine, it was producing in them the same thing that was being produced in the kings, the priests, and the prophets. It couldn't produce anything different. So in the light of the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel, as prophesied here by Isaiah, in the light of that, and that he's going to look for the remnant, he's going he's to go and find within the nation those that don't want to drink that wine, those that, won't, that don't want to have that stuff produced in them. So now, watch what he says. Now the question up at verse 9, comes up at verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Well, it's not going to be the royal lineage, verse 1. They're wearing the crown of pride. It's not going to be the priests and the prophets that are drinking all that strong drink and that, that false doctrine of the wine of the scribes and Pharisees. That's not who he's going to teach knowledge to. Hold Isaiah 28. Go back to Matthew 11. Look back in Matthew 11, 25. Matthew eleven twenty-five. 25, it says this. 
at 11.25, we read this a few moments ago, it says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. Okay, that's Isaiah 28, verse 1, all the way down through that section there. The wise and the prudent. The royalty lineage that was supposed to be the leaders of the, na of the nation, the priests and the prophets, that says they're not interested in God's word. They're interested in the tradition of the elders. So he says this, I, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. How did Christ know that? Well, go back to Isaiah 28. Well, you say, well, he knew it because he was God. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm not discounting that. But he knew it because he's reading Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28 told Israel ahead of time who it was that he was going to teach knowledge and wisdom to. When you look at Isaiah 28, verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Well, here's the answer. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. You see the idea? The wheat in the context from the milk of what? The milk of the false doctrine of those that wore the crown of pride and the priests and the prophets that were drinking their wine, as it were. So he says, I'm, I'm going to teach, I'm going to look for those in Israel that are going to be, they're going to, I've got to wean them from the milk, the false doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees. I've got to draw them from the breasts of that false doctrine. That's who I'm going to look for. And by him putting the word out there, that's how he will find them. He's letting the word of God do the work of God. He says, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. That's exactly what he's doing in his ministry. He's looking for those that will join the little flock and then teach them step by step, precept upon precept. He says, for with stammering lips and other tongue will he speak to this people, the people, that's Israel, to whom he said, this is the rest. Wherewith ye shall cause the... That little phrase there, verse 12, to whom he said, this is the rest. Didn't he say the kingdom's at hand? That's the rest. He tells Israel it was at hand. The rest is right here. Messiah is there. He's ready to bring in the kingdom as it were. He shouted out, this is the rest. Wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. Didn't he say, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, dear weary under the burdens and bondage of the scribes and Pharisees. And he calls them to rest in him. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was, un, uh, was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they may go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. He's going to distinguish by him preaching the word and the word identifying within the nation those who would come to him as babes, that's going to manifest those that reject him. That's how he's going to identify the remnant. You see, everybody, is this kind of making sense how this is going on here? Isn't that fascinating? So when you go back then quickly, if you would, 1 Peter, um, man, there, there's, there, there's so much going on. When you get a chance, read the rest of Isaiah 28. It's quite amazing what's going on. But go, quickly, if you would, because we're, we're out of time real quick. Go, go, go to 1 Peter chapter 2 once again here. 1 Peter chapter number 2. So Peter is making it very clear that the audience he's writing to here, these newborn babes, he's saying, guys, you are the babes that Isaiah prophesied the Messiah would come and find you. So he's teaching them line upon line, precept upon precept. So you think Hebrews, then James, then Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. You see how he's building upon that doctrine? He tells them here, in 1 Peter 2, 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all, all evil speaking. So that, that's the first part of Isaiah 28, remember? As newborn babes. They are the babes of Isaiah 28. Weaned from the breast. Weaned from the milk of the false doctrine of the elders. 
as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And that's exactly what they have experienced so far. Next time we'll connect that with, the, with uh, Hebrews 6. They tasted of the good word of God. They were made partakers of the heavenly gift. They got a foretaste of the blessings of the promise of the new covenant. And he reminds them that, listen, if you've tasted that, then imagine what the taste is going to be like in the kingdom when you have the fullness of the blessings. Okay? All right, before we wrap it up, any, any questions that need to be clarified on specifically what we looked at this morning? Rich, go ahead. That's exactly right. Let me repeat that for the folks on the internet. Rich brought up the passage in Matthew 21 where Christ said about the scribes and Pharisees that the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And Peter, as he continues here, he's actually going to make a direct connection with that exact point. So you see, is it interesting how the mind connected with that? That's, that's awesome. That's exactly where Peter is going here. Okay. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the time to look into your word and the insight and the wisdom that we can receive from your word as we study it in the light of the context in which it fits. And we'll thank you for this. We recognize that when Peter says to the audience here that uh, to des desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby, that the parallel for us is that have that desire to continue to grow and to take your word into our soul because it absolutely will produce spiritual growth in our lives. And do so for your glory and honor. In Christ's name, amen.